Since we recorded our timeline video, um, the LAMC has come out with a couple of updates we wanted to make everyone aware of. Um, the first that we mentioned in passing is the new testing dates they have available and that they've shortened the MCAT for that. So um, we'll link down below for more information regarding that. The update that's more pertinent to the timeline video is that they've pushed back the transmission originally slated for June 26th to July 10th. Um, though the transmission date may have been shifted, the general advice in the video still holds. Submit your application when you feel confident that you've put everything together um, as best as you can um, and aim for submitting definitely before the transmission date of July 10th. Um, obviously, any earlier is better, but you don't want to be compromising quality for a couple of days of speed that you might be getting. All right, back to the original video. So with this video in particular, I think that what Maya and I want to do is lay out kind of a rough calendar for how the process um, looks. Um, as many of you will know, the AAMC AMCAS application will open in less than a month. Um, and so what to be thinking about as um, one, move one moves forward in preparing to apply and kind of what the process looks like I know for me personally, I did not anticipate or realize how long the process would be and would feel. And so I think it's just good to be able to have a frame of reference or a space where um, you're under a rough space to understand the kind of timeline trajectory of the process. Definitely. Yeah. So um, I guess to start off with, we wanted to talk a little bit about like how submission of applications works and the timeline with that, because I feel like a lot of times like the advice you hear from people is like apply early, apply early. And for me personally, I was like, but what does that mean? <laughs> like there's so many dates. <laughs> um, so as Kenneth said, the um, AMCAS application will open in about a month. So it's going to open on May 4th. And as far as we've heard so far, just monitoring school communications, that's not going to be pushed back um, because of COVID. So basically, when the application opens up, all that means is that you can go in and you can start filling out the information online, but you can't actually submit your application until May 28th. So you don't need to worry about, for example, having your application ready to go by May 4th. That's just really the first date when you can start filling in data um, if you want to on there. But most of the times, like you can just do your prompts on paper or whatever you want, since there's no real benefit to starting right on May 4th to write everything in. Um, so at that point, at May 28th, you can start submitting. But then again, there's kind of another little block because applications won't be transmitted to schools until June 30th. So what happens after you submit your application is that it goes through this manual verification process by people who are basically hired just to do this. So they'll go through and they'll check all of your courses, make sure it matches your transcripts, um, calculate your science GPA and other things that kind of need some like human eyes on it. And then once that verification process is finished, they'll send applications off to schools as early as this June 30th. So um, you really can submit any time within June and still be, you know, early or on time. But for me personally, one thing that I didn't realize is that depending on when you submit in June, that influences how quickly your application will get verified. So especially as you get into like the middle to the end of June, like everyone is often submitting at that time. So verification times can take like a week or two weeks. So you kind of just have that extra time that you're just waiting for your application to get verified. So I would say that the earliest you can have like what you feel really strongly about as a good application in June, the better. But honestly, even if you submit by like in the June 20s, which is like when I did, you'll still be fine. But there might be a little bit of a lag and when you get interview invites, nothing crazy, but you might notice a little bit. Yeah, I think that by end of June is a good hard deadline for yourself. Um, I think that the only thing that I would else that I would add is to when the May 4th opens up, um, things that you could be filling out include grades, GPA, activities, um, any of the clerical um, things that don't require much forethought is something that I would recommend you just fill out um, straight away because 
it's just going to be one less thing on your plate as um, you have juggling three different prompts um, to write for. So I think that just clearing that out of your way, um, one, it makes you feel productive. You got <laughs> stuff done. You feel um, in some blanks, but also just peace of mind and just allows you more space to think about um, the three prompts that you have to write to. So then after after um, that AMCAS application, um, that's called colloquially the primary, schools will then um, send out secondaries. So secondaries are school specific prompts that individual schools will ask you to um, write for. Um, and there is some overlap between um, prompts, um, as you imagine, YMD, PhD. Um, another reiteration of that, even though you had it on your primary, is a common one or some kind of um, prompt that speaks to leadership or community service or something like that are common prompts that you will encounter in secondaries. Um, I know we're going to want to do some more videos, but the thing to be cognizant or something you can do during this time um, pre um, getting those secondaries is you can actually look online for past prompts. Um, many of them are repeated and you can start sketching out those, but I would suggest doing that after you've completed your three primary essays um, um, before that. I think those shouldn't be um, the primary, the major focus um, of this time. Definitely. Yeah, so um, some, most secondaries will just come to you automatically once schools receive your application. So I would say like, by the beginning of July, you'll start to get those secondaries, so they do come fast. Um, but also do know that like there may be some secondaries that you end up getting later. So certain schools will also screen for their secondaries, which basically means that they'll create, um, they'll go through your application, whether that's like manually by people or in some cases it's just like a GPA and MCAT cutoff. But based off of that, they'll decide whether or not to send you a secondary. Um, and like one really big example of this is the University of California system does this. So if you're applying to like any of the UC schools, for them specifically, you'll see a leg. So for me personally, I got one UC secondary um, at the end of August, and I submitted my application at the end of June. So like, definitely expect that there might be a, a bit of a lag in some secondaries and try not to read too much into that. It takes a while to do that manual process as you can imagine. And there's actually one school that you need to be proactive about your secondary, which I actually didn't know at the time. So University of Washington, UW, um, you actually go on their website and sign up for a secondary. So that's something that <laughs> was not aware of, yeah. but also can happen. So I'm um, just be um, cognizant of whether or not, if you haven't seen any communication, uh, just be cognizant and be aware if you're not getting any communication from a school that you thought you should be getting communication from, just look on their website and lo and behold, there it was. So um, <laughs> it is a bit of um, a juggling task. Um, spreadsheets were helpful, at least on my end. I kept a spreadsheet, um, which I quickly deleted recently because I'm like <laughs> over it, but. Um, during the time was very helpful for me and um, I think it's just good practice to be organized in general. So yeah, yeah so after secondaries which um, turn around usually it's thought to be expected to be two weeks, um, not that hard of a deadline but just a good practice to be timely about these things. Um, so interviews can roll in as early as March and can drag all the way till I'm going to say early as March. I mean, early as August and drag all the way into March. Um, so those um, are um, can come in almost at any time. And so it's a long interview season. Um, things that you could be thinking about right now is where you're going to be located. If your airport is a hub for a particular airline, then maybe think about signing up for their mileage um, rewards program. Um, so things like that and earn those points, get cheaper airfare. Um, it does come out to be an expensive process. Um, oftentimes secondaries come with fees in addition to the fees you already paid when you uh, first initially submit your AMCAS. Um, so being aware of that um, is, so yeah, sign up for a credit card <laughs> that gives you good points is kind of the takeaway from that one. Um, 
uh, Chase Sapphire pr Reserve is seems to be. I actually don't even have it, so I, I actually don't know which one it is. But it's one of the Chase Sapphire Reserve Premium. They've added too many words to it, but that seems to be the general consensus of a good generic one to get. Um, I ended up getting in the last one personally because I was flying. I was based out of New York, and they were doing double mileage on transcontinental flights, so that worked out well for me. Um, so just being um, something to think about that it's on no one's radar when yeah. um, first embarking on this. Yes, definitely. Yeah, it's a really long interview season and there's just gonna be a lot of like travel and stuff like that. So like also something to think about at this time is like just letting people know who, who will be like expecting you to be present. So whether you're in a lab doing research, like make sure you've talked to your PI or your supervisor yeah. about that and kind of just set expectations that like, this is something that you're doing for your um, MD, PhD admissions. And it's sometimes you're, it's gonna be unavoidable that you'll be away from lab. And, you know, same with your professors if you're in school, like I was, um, just talk to them. You might have to loop in depending on your school, kind of your advisor, um, whether that's a pre-med advisor, an academic advisor, just to make sure that um, everyone knows that you're gone for a good reason and so you don't have that extra stress hanging around um, in your head that oh no I'm leaving in two days and I also have a midterm and now what am I gonna do. But also feel free to like use the weekend to also like visit friends you have in a city that you are interviewing at. I think that um, part of the process is, you, is exploring the areas that you would have might not have gone out to otherwise or taking the opportunity to catch up with people or explore. So I think that's also an important part of the process that isn't formally part of the process. Yeah. I feel like for me, like when I was going to new cities for interviews, like I didn't have enjoyment at all in my head because I was like, I'm really nervous. Like I'm here for an interview, but like in retrospect, like I really encourage you if you if you can and you're able to put aside those nerves for a little bit, just like soak up this experience of like traveling and like meeting really cool professors, like really cool students, because it is kind of this like once in a lifetime opportunity, you know, barring residency applications, yeah. where you get to like just travel and like kind of talk about your research in medicine and like that that's really cool too. Yeah, no, absolutely totally agree. I remember being so nervous in my first interview. I I can't tell you the sense of the program, the sense of the community or anything from that first program because I was just so nervous. I think that once you get out of your system, you'll have a better appreciation of the program just by being less nervous and being more aware. Also just the better sense of the environment generally around the program at the institution, at the specific locale where the institution is located. So yeah, for sure, definitely to like stop and smell the roses kind of thing is really important. Yeah, and this kind of goes into revisits and decisions. Obvious disclaimer, we've had a, a unique revisit experience um, this time around, so we can't speak to the traditional revisit experience, but in general, I actually ended up writing a letter of intent to Penn because um, I knew after my interview that that's where I wanted to go, so maybe Maya can uh, talk more about what things were important for her um, going through this revisit process. Yeah. So um, around revisits and decisions, there's kind of two more dates to think about. So the first is April 15th, and that's coming up pretty soon. And that's basically the date where if you hold um, more than three acceptances, you have to drop down to three acceptances. And then April 30th is the day where you um, basically pick a school that, you know, as of now, if nothing changed, you would go to. So depending on whether you pick um, plan to enroll, um, that basically says like, I plan to come here, but if I'm on a wait list, for example, and I get off, I may choose to go there instead. Um, or you can do commit to enroll, which basically means like it's binding. I'm definitely coming here. I'm withdrawing from all my wait lists. So when you're thinking about revisits, you'll see that there tends to be most revisits happening before that April 15th date. Um, not all schools, but a lot of them, just so that you kind of have that information going into um, when you drop down. But I would say that revisits like they're kind of like the best parts of interviews that we were just talking about. Um, again, I didn't necessarily get this experience because of COVID, but most of the times you'll get flown out. So um, even if a school didn't pay for your flights, kind of for your interview, they'll almost definitely pay for your flight or your train ride or whatever to go to that school. And really it's just their time where it kind of switches and they're recruiting you. 
Um, but more importantly, it's really a chance to kind of reevaluate the program without the stress of interview day. Now that you've gone through the cycle, you might have a better idea of what your research interests are. You can meet PIs if you didn't get to meet them the first time. You can get to know the students better. But I really think what revisits are most important for, specifically for MD-PhD applicants, is getting to know the people who will probably join your co cohort. Because for MD-PhD, um, obviously it's a really long program. The people you start medical school with will have graduated by the time that you finish your MD-PhD. So you really wanna make sure that the people who are in your incoming cohort and even the older MD-PhD students are people that you enjoy spending time with and you feel like you have a lot in common with because they're gonna become your support system and they're gonna be kind of like some of the main people in your life for like this next almost 10 years. And yeah. I think it's really important to think about that. So thinking forward, I think that we've laid out kind of an outline of what the next few immediate months might look like. I think one of the things we're gonna do in this series uh, specifically is to drill down on some aspects of the next few months that we want to highlight and talk more generally about. I think next we wanna talk um, about, um, in the next video, assembling a school list, what kind of factors we wanna be triangulating um, and thinking about um, when putting together um, a school list of where to apply to. Um, and then moving down the line, we're going to be thinking about putting together the AMCAS application with those three essays. Um, kind of, who are we asking letters of recs? Our letter of recs are one of the places where the MD versus the MD PhD path kind of diverges a bit. So I think it'd be, I think we could, we think it'd be good to spend some time um, articulating and fleshing that out a bit more. So those are the kind of videos that we hope to release within the next month or so in preparation for um, people to start um, working on their MCAS application. Yes. So um, also we'll be posting this and presumably if you're watching this, you've seen it posted on YouTube or some other type of forum. So like definitely feel free to comment or yeah. let us know. Um, you can also tweet to us. Um, we'll put our Twitter handles up here once we edit the video. <laughs> um, but yeah, like let us know what's on your mind. Like if you have any questions, we have a lot of free time. So <laughs> like, please, like please. Don't get I'm, I'm so bored so yeah but definitely and we enjoy talking about this like yeah. this is something that is near and dear to us we've just gone through it um and it's just fun talking about this with people who are passionate and excited about what they want to do and um it's gonna be it's gonna be fun yeah we're super excited so come along 